It is a privilege for me to join you here in Atlanta. For whatever reason, I have been to Atlanta relatively few times, but I'm happy to start making up for it today. Please turn in Holy Scripture to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to read verses 2 to 19. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 to 19. Hear then what Holy Scripture says. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are, <clears throat> are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others, We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. This is the word of the Lord. I wonder if there's anybody in this assembly who got up this morning and looked in the mirror and said to himself or herself, I'm greater than Isaiah, or I'm greater than King David, or I outclass Esther. And of course, our instant reaction to that is, that would be a silly thing to do. I mean, it's arrogant, it's ignorant. And yet, look at verse 11. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, which is a reasonably comprehensive category, <laughs> truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So in Jesus' estimate, John the Baptist is greater than Abraham. John the Baptist is greater than Moses. John the Baptist is greater than David. John the Baptist is greater than Esther. John the Baptist is greater than Isaiah. That's the nature of the comparison that is being laid out. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Are you among the least in the kingdom of heaven? But Jesus says... The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist 
is greater than all who came before him. It is simply impossible to avoid the conclusion that the least in the kingdom of heaven, that's you and me, is greater than Abraham or Isaiah or David. Now, clearly, we're not greater in every respect. Nobody is going to suggest that I am greater militarily than David or that I'm a greater prophet than Isaiah. And yet, what Jesus is saying is, in his own estimate, very important. See how he begins? Truly, I tell you. That's one of his formulas for saying, listen up. What I'm telling you is important. Pay attention. And what is important, what he wants us to pay attention to, is this observation that the least in the kingdom is greater than Abraham or David, or Isaiah. On what scale? On what axis? Why is that important? Well, the way to answer that question, I suspect, the best way to answer that question is to follow the flow of the logic in the passage that we read. And it can be broken down into three steps. First, portrait of a discouraged Baptist. I am not speaking denominationally. I'm talking about John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. What we find is that John has been arrested and has been incarcerated in the prison at Mechedes. At this point, it was not a hard deal particularly. He still had access to his own disciples who came and went and doubtless brought him some food, maybe some clothing. He doesn't know that in three more chapters, his head's going to be taken off his shoulders. He doesn't know that. So he's not in a terribly bad situation. But while he's in prison, he hears, we're told, about the deeds of the Messiah, verse 2. Now, when Matthew talks about Jesus ordinarily, he refers to him simply as Jesus. But here he calls him the Messiah, the Christ. And the reason why is because Matthew wants his readers to know that this man whom John the Baptist is doubting is, at the end of the day, the Messiah, the promised one the Christ. We cannot avoid the obvious conclusion that John the Baptist is entertaining doubts. Why? There have been lots of believers, both in the Old Testament Scriptures and in the New Testament Scriptures, who suffer a lot more than John the Baptist suffered. He wasn't beaten up. He wasn't being tortured. He wasn't starving to death. He still had access to friends. But he has come to wonder whether or not this man, Jesus, whom he has been pointing out to people, really is the Messiah after all. Why is he doubting? What is the nature of his doubt? The way to find out, of course, is to remind yourself what John the Baptist had preached about this Jesus. And to do that, you simply go back to Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, we read, This is John the Baptist talking now, John 3.11, and Matthew 3.11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John reminds himself what Jesus has been doing. He's been teaching, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. He's been performing spectacular miracles, Matthew 8 and 9. And he's been organizing a trainee mission to get his disciples prepared for carrying on the mission after he's gone, chapter 10. That's what Jesus has been doing. That is what constitutes the deeds of the Messiah. But John the Baptist is asking himself, where's the fire? Where's the destruction? John the Baptist had preached that the one who came after him that was surpassing him and better than he was, was coming not only with messianic blessings, but with messianic judgment. Where's the judgment? The teaching is good, the miracles are fine, the trainee mission is great, but where's the judgment? 
And so John the Baptist has doubts. So how does Jesus respond to this? Through the messengers, of course. We find that out in verses 4 and 5. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. In other words, summarize my ministry to John, to your master. Go back and report. Then he says, verse 5, a list of things that he has transparently been doing. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now the interesting thing is that almost everything on that list is actually drawn from Isaiah 35. Here's Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, looking to the blessings that will come in the Messianic age. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. In other words, Jesus is claiming to fulfill the promised messianic blessings of Isaiah 35. Not only so, but in Isaiah 61, there's another blessing that is announced. There the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's one of the things that Jesus himself has been doing. Matthew chapter 11. The dead are raised and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. The only thing that's left out from the list in Matthew is healing of leprosy. Isaiah doesn't mention that, but all the rest is mentioned. And so Jesus is saying, go and tell John the Baptist what I'm doing. And he lists these things, and he lists them in the same order that they're found in Isaiah. And Jesus knows that John the Baptist knows the text of Isaiah. Now, if I were to say to you, you must be born again, and then ask you where that's from, what would you say? Somebody? John 3, John 3, John 3. Which is about whom? Jesus is having a conversation with? Nicodemus, Nicodemus. So I don't have to say Nicodemus and mention John 3. Those of you who are biblically literate know that when I say you must be born again, that's drawn from John 3, and it's the Nicodemus story. Do you see? Well, if John the Baptist knows the text of Isaiah 35 and 61, and he does, elsewhere he quotes Isaiah with lots of comfort, then he knows what Jesus is saying. He's saying, the things that John the Baptist, that Jesus are, are do, is doing, the things that Jesus is doing are, are fulfillment of the promises that were actually made by Isaiah the prophet 700 years ago. But John the Baptist also knows that Jesus has left something out. In Isaiah 35, yes, Verse 5, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and so on. But the immediately preceding two verses say, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Jesus left that out. And John the Baptist knows that Jesus has left that out. And in Isaiah 61, yes, verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, the Messiah says, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. But in the next verse, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And Jesus left, leaves that bit out. But John the Baptist knows that Jesus has left it out. And Jesus knows that John the Baptist knows that he's left it out. And John the Baptist knows that Jesus knows that John the Baptist has left it out. Now, this is not an infinite regression, and I'm not just pulling your leg. I'm trying to make a point. These two are communicating with each other because they both know the biblical text. Do you see? So as a result, John the Baptist is left wondering, why did Jesus leave out the vengeance part, the divine retribution part? And the hint of the answer is found in verse 6, Matthew 11, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. 
Do you see what Jesus is saying? The promised messianic blessings have started. The messianic age has dawned. You can look around and spot these blessings that are the fulfillment of the promises found in Isaiah. They're there. And if the judgment hasn't come yet, if the day of vengeance hasn't come, if the day of retribution, of wrath, has not yet dawned, well, it's not here yet. Don't be discouraged. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Press on. Persevere. Now, there is the picture of a discouraged Baptist. Now, apparently, Jesus has this conversation with John the Baptist's disciples in front of other people, maybe where Jesus is preaching outside and others are listening into the congregation, to, to, the, to the conversation. And, and undoubtedly, there are some who are saying to themselves something like this. Well, John the Baptist is turning out to be a bit of a disappointment, isn't he? A bit of a wimp. We thought he was really good. Now you throw him in jail and he chickens out. Where's the backbone? And Jesus won't have it. Jesus defends John the Baptist in the next verses. So portrait of a discouraged Baptist, portrait of a defended Baptist. Verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Hmm? That is, when you went out to listen to this itinerant preacher called John, who's preaching out in the wilderness near the Jordan or someplace like that. Why, why did you go out? Long, dusty road. Why did you go out? What were you expecting to see? Hmm? A reed swayed by the wind. No backbone pushed over by every puff of breeze. Is that what you're expecting? Were you expecting a wimp? And of course, they know full well that they went out because he was a great preacher. He had fire in his belly. He got people's attention. He was calling the nation to repentance. Even kings he challenged in their immorality. He was a courageous man. He wasn't a wimp. So what right did they have to accuse him of being a wimp now? How dare you? So Jesus defends John the Baptist as earlier John the Baptist had defended Jesus. But when John the Baptist defends Jesus, he says things like, he must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus doesn't turn around and say, oh yeah, and you must increase, but I must decrease too. We'll all be extra humble. Rather, the way Jesus defends John the Baptist is, as we'll see in a moment, absolutely shatteringly different. So here's Jesus' defense of John the Baptist. What did you go to see? A reed swayed by the wind? No. Verse 8, if not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Did you go because you heard this preacher was really posh? He had some cash. You might be able to snucker up to him and, and maybe get some material blessings poured out upon you. Is that why you went out to hear him? You went out because you wanted some blessings. Maybe do a miracle and make you rich. Is that why they went out? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. They're not out in the desert calling people to repentance. So what did you go out to see then? Hmm? When you went out to listen to this preacher called John, what did you go to see? Hmm? What did you expect? A prophet? Now Jesus has asked two of these rhetorical questions so far and the answer has been no. A reed? No. A posh, rich dude? No. A prophet? This time Jesus answers, yes, he's a prophet, and more than a prophet. Now, in what way is John the Baptist more than a prophet? Well, verse 10 tells us, this is the one about whom it is written, and now he quotes a prophecy from Malachi, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. In other words, John the Baptist is not only a prophet speaking the word of God, He's also a man who is the subject of a particular Old Testament prophecy. The prophecy of Malachi, which you can find in your Bible in Malachi 3.1. And there in Malachi 3.1, God says he will send his messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before the visitation of God himself. That's stunning. 
And then Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, this morning, John Dees introduced me. Supposing after he'd introduced me, I got up here and said, Brothers and sisters, I give you this most solemn word. John Dees is the greatest man who ever lived because he introduced me. How long would it be before some of you phoned the people with white coats and ambulances to take me away? It's so ridiculous, it's laughable. The punchline to a bad joke. But you must see that that's exactly what Jesus says. John is not only a prophet, he's the subject of an Old Testament prophecy that announces that a man codenamed Elijah in the book of Malachi will come to announce the visitation of God. And I tell you, Jesus says, that makes him the greatest man who ever lived. Oh, there is a sense, as we all know, if we read our Bibles, that Abraham points out who Jesus is. And Aaron the priest points out who Jesus is. And King David points out who Jesus is. And the prophet Isaiah points out who Jesus is. And Ruth is in the line of Jesus. But it fell to only one person, one man, John the Baptist, to point a finger in space-time history and say, he must increase and I must decrease. This is the one of whom the prophets spoke. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what makes him great. John is greater than Abraham because he points out who Jesus is with greater clarity and immediacy than Abraham. He's greater than David because he points out with greater clarity and immediacy who Jesus is. All those Old Testament figures which did have roles in redemptive history to point out who Jesus is, yes, but it came to one man, John the Baptist, according to the prophecy of Malachi, to stand there at the crossroads of history and point out this is the one. So there's the portrait of a defended Baptist. And then in the last section, which brings us to us, and what it means to us, you have a portrait of an eclipsed Baptist. Now John is bypassed. Look at verse 11 again. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. <clears throat> Yet, Whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The least in the kingdom, that's people like you and me. We're greater than John the Baptist. Now for verse 11 to hold together, the comparison in the first part of the verse must be on the same basis as the comparison in the second part of the verse, or else the verse doesn't stand up. In the first part of the verse, John the Baptist is greater than those who came before him because he introduces Jesus. In the second part of the verse, you must say that those who are least in the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist because they introduce Jesus with greater clarity and immediacy than John the Baptist could. I don't know this assembly. Some of you, no doubt, have been Christians for decades. But some of you, I suspect, have been Christians for six weeks or so. Something in that age range. And, and if somebody starts asking you questions about your knowledge of the gospel and of the Lord and of the Bible, you might answer something like this. Well, I know you guys talk about the Trinity. That doesn't make much sense to me yet. I guess I'll get it someday. I haven't read the Bible right through. In fact, I've barely read it at all. But, but I, I, I do know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I, I do know that he rose again. I do know that he promises to come back and make everything new, a new heaven and a new earth. 
I, I do know that he's changed my heart. I, I, I don't understand how he's done it, but I, but I understand that. And I've experienced it. Now, do you see, if you do that, you are already speaking more immediately and more clearly about the gospel of Christ than Isaiah did. Than King David did. Than John the Baptist did. And that's what makes you great. So suddenly we see how incredibly incomprehensible it is to be a Christian and say nothing about Christ to others. Because the sharing of the gospel of Christ is precisely what places us in our rank in redemptive history. Now, the rest of the verses in this section that I read, down to verse 19, justify this reading. And I don't have time to go through them in detail. I'll make a few observations about them, then we'll stop and think what it looks like for us today. Verse 12 is one of the verses in Matthew that is most disputed in its meaning. I warn you in advance, if you have different translations, it'll come across, it'll come across in several different ways. Uh, I won't go through all of the different uh, ways of understanding the verse. I'll simply tell you the truth. Um, I'll tell you what I think it means. I think it, this is the way to take it without trying to defend it. From the days of John the Baptist until now, this is Jesus talking, from the days of John the Baptist, the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, when Jesus began his public ministry, from the beginning of my public ministry in the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. I think it actually is saying has itself been violently advancing, advancing with power. Jesus performs miracles. He raises the dead. People are forgiven. People who are born blind see. The kingdom of heaven is the king operating. The kingdom of heaven is powerfully advancing. And violent people have been attacking it, have been raiding it back. That's very clear in the next chapter where Jesus casts out some demons and the opponent simply said, Oh, he's doing this in the name of the devil himself. No wonder he's powerful. He's the devil's toolkit. So they attack back, they attack back, attack back. So although the kingdom is advancing, there's a contest going on. It's not, it's not suddenly the kingdom comes and it's all over, big bang. The kingdom is advancing, but people are fighting back and fighting back and fighting back. Violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, that's the first comparison at the beginning of verse 11, John is greater than all who came before. And if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is the Elijah who was to come. From Malachi chapter 3, the Elijah was to come to announce the coming visitation of God himself. If you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So you are to understand John's place in redemptive history along a certain axis. Then Jesus gives two vignettes to explain further. He pictures a group of kids in the marketplace. One group of kids is energetic and creative and wants to get going on things. And one of them says, let's play, let's, let's, let's play marriages. You be the bride. You be the groom. You can be the officiant. We'll, we'll have happy music. Get out our flutes. Play happy music and dance. We'll play happy weddings. Let's do that. And the others say, boring. We did that last week. I don't want to play happy marriages again. Don't want to. Boring. All right, all right, the other group says. Let's play funerals. You can be the corpse. We need some pallbearers and an officiant again. And instead of happy dance music, we'll play dirges. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. 
So eventually the response comes. Children sitting in the marketplaces calling out to others, we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. You won't do anything. You're just critics. And that's how you respond both to Jesus and to John the Baptist. John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. He was so ascetic that he was awed. He was so ascetic he wouldn't take any alcohol at all. He was so ascetic, he, he, he took the Nazarite vows and wouldn't cut his hair. He was so ascetic, he, 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 he was strange. The only possible explanation for someone to be that ascetic is demon-possessed. Jesus came along. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. He was known to go to parties. In fact, if they ran out of booze, he made some. <laughs> Read John 2 for yourself. He was a happy guy. And he made friends of the most ridiculous people. Here is a glutton and a drunkard. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You can tell a person by the friends he makes. You can tell a person if she's really corrupt because of the friends she's got. Jesus was not all that wise to them in his choice of friends. So... When John the Baptist is ascetic, they criticize him. When Jesus starts a party, they criticize him. But Jesus wants to announce the dawning of the kingdom. Happy days are coming. They don't want that either. No matter what they do, no matter what God does in the unfolding of his purposes in redemptive history, they're just critics. They don't listen to the call for repentance and brokenness and contrition and faith. And they don't call, they don't respond positively to the call for hallelujah choruses and cheering because the kingdom is dawning. But Jesus' final pronouncement? Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. That is wisdom, how you live under God's self-disclosure. Wisdom is being worked out in both John the Baptist and Jesus. They were called to different things that complemented each other. John the Baptist calling the nation to repentance in preparation for Jesus. Jesus coming with the dawning of the kingdom. So now we understand what verse 11 is about. How does it apply to us? Let me reiterate again. Greatness should never be measured by the world's criteria. How do you see yourself? What determines your self-identity? What makes you able to look at yourself in the mirror in the morning? Your good looks? Your intelligence? Your education? Your strength? Your sense of humor? Your money, your popularity, your youth, your organizing ability. All, all of those things have their places and, and rightly used, they're all gifts from God. But is that who you are? So the most important thing about you is how you started off in a wood shack and now are a multimillionaire. Is that the most important thing about you? No, the question is, do you accept what Jesus tells us is the more, most important thing about the least in the kingdom? Not how big the church is. Not how many people have made professions of faith. Oh, the, those are important things, but that's not the most important thing about you. The most important thing about you is that you have been placed by God in this particular sphere in redemptive history to point out with greater clarity than those who came in a bygone age who Jesus is and what he's done. Which means it is almost past finding out how stupid we are when we don't share our faith with others. Well, I'm as guilty as the next person. I can, 
get on an airplane and somebody's chatting next to me and I think, oh boy, I want to have a snooze. This bozo wants to talk. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I have sometimes had my best occasions to share the glory of Christ when I talk with an unbeliever on a plane. So what makes you greater than John the Baptist? Where you live in the stream of redemptive history, you know more about the gospel in theory and in practice than all who came in earlier ages. And that's what makes you great. There is another thing that could be said about John the Baptist. It's in another passage. It's not saying quite the same thing, but it's relevant. At the end of John 10, we're told, Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, John never performed a sign. He never performed a miracle. But all that John said about this man, Jesus, was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. I'm 76. One of these days, I'll die. Cheer up, so will you. Unless Jesus comes back first. And if I have to have an epitaph, how about this one? Don Carson never performed a miracle. But everything he said about Jesus was true. That's Jesus' epitaph for John. This Jesus who says that the least in the kingdom is greater than John precisely because we can say it more clearly than John could. That's an epitaph we should all want. To bear witness with clarity and immediacy to the Lord Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we are so easily snookered by the blinding fancies of a passing age. Forgive us our sins, our mortal blindness, and enable us to look at things from eternity's perspective. For Jesus' sake, amen.